Steph, why is this particularly special and incarnational for you and me on this very day? So <laughs> I didn't know you were going to go there. We have to. <laughs> Reg and I. Jesus is a personalizing God. Let's personalize this a little bit. Yes. So we are coming up tomorrow on celebrating our silver wedding anniversary, 25 wow. years together. Wow. So we just wow. are so grateful. And um, wow. obviously for the the Lord bringing us together mm. in the sacramental union and just thinking even um, the people that the Lord has blessed by bringing into our lives that has just enriched mm. um, the gift of our marriage and how he has loved us and challenged us and grown us so beautifully through those people, through friends like you, Bob, and different married couples, mentors, shout out to Jack and Jackie and Phil Hertzfeld, um, you know who you are, <laughs> who've been married 58 years, maybe. Uh -huh. So just in, in that realm, family members, um, but in particular, any priest who happens to be listening or watching, uh -huh. just Thank how you. these are vocations so beautifully um, build upon each other and intertwine and in that life of the Trinity in, in each unique way. So um, we love you, priests. We are blessed by you and know of our prayers for you. So we are going to declare the kingdom, declare God's love, and declare his desire for us to know him deeply, intimately, personally. And he provides a means to do that, certainly his church, but as marriage is flowing, those streams of living water to awaken us all the more fully to that identity, right? That we can live out that mission fully and rediscover it. We're just going to sit back and be blessed by Bob. You know, enumerate, if you will, these, again, these five areas of unity that we encourage you to check out more fully in his book, Be Devoted, and other really, truly fabulous books, I might even say life-changing, awakening books that are being shared throughout the world, making a huge difference, very worthy of husbands and wives to read, uh, parish teams to read, because he brings such honesty, clarity with his uh, craft, if you will, as a PhD in these areas, but his personal experience and really the fullness of the Catholic faith, orthodoxy, but infused with that dynamism of the Holy Spirit, which is what it means to be Catholic. So with no further intro, I guess, that we could say a lot more. Yes. We turn it over to you, Dr. Bob. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Stephanie. And happy anniversary tomorrow. You've Thank you. left a lot of fruit so far, and it's only increasing. Um, so these five areas of, of unity and marriage are really modeled after the Trinitarian community. So I love that the whole teaching has been organized around the Trinity, because it's really the the image of marriage, if you will, it's the, it's the blueprint for marriage. So I like to say that the, the the Trinity is the heavenly family, and the holy family mirrors the heavenly family. In fact, one of the members of the heavenly family is in the holy family, uh, and and Joseph then kind of represents the Father, and Mary, who is full of grace, is full of the Holy Spirit. So we get a picture of that Trinitarian communion when we look at the holy family. But every family was designed by God. The Holy Family is, is the redemption of what God had intended from the beginning. And so when we look at the Holy Family, we see the kind of intimacy and communion and closeness and unity that God desires for each one of our families, each one of our marriages. And yet we know that we also struggle with sin, so that this is an ongoing process of growth. And that's why these five areas are really for the purpose of rebuilding or building for the first time, uh, for many of us, areas of unity and intimacy that uh, mirror that kind of communion. So those five areas are spiritual unity, and I'll go through each one of these in more depth, spiritual unity, emotional intimacy, uh, cooperative teamwork, uh, daily companionship, and sexual intimacy. And in our world, we tend to skip the first four and go to the, the fifth one. And then we see the damage that that does, because without the other four, uh, sexual intimacy, which was reserved, intended by God to be reserved for marriage, uh, can't have its fullness without the covenant of marriage and without the other four being uh, the life that allows that kind of intimacy to be physically, emotionally, and spiritually uh, real and connected. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the damage that's done when we don't have those other areas. Um, so the first area is spiritual unity. 
And it's really what the sacrament is. It's, it's the thing that distinguishes a Christian marriage, a Catholic marriage from any other kind of marriage, that it's uh, living in the grace of the Holy Spirit, the grace of the sacraments, that, that, that Jesus himself is a part of that bond. And so he's already at the very beginning created something that didn't exist before. It's very different than a man and woman coming together and loving each other sexually. It's not only their commitment to each other, but it's God's commitment to that marriage, uh, that he's been invited to be the, the glue of that bond. And so a couple that has that as the foundation has invited love into their marriage. You know, if God is love and we don't invite God into the marriage, then what we're not inviting is we're not inviting love into the marriage. What we're inviting is some kind of counterfeit uh, of love, which often de, de uh, values into lust, you know, which is a mutual using of each other. And none of us want that. None of us want to be used for the other. None of us want to be seen as an object uh, for another person. But it's only love that allows us to see each other with purity, with the eyes of God, uh, you know, to, to see each other from the heart and see each other in their wholeness. And so the, the spiritual unity is, is the unity of being able to not only to uh, have Christ at the center of the marriage and always all the interactions of the marriage then flowing out of that bond of three rather than just two, but it's also inviting the Holy Spirit to be the love bond between us, just like he is between the Father and Son and the Trinity. And so if we have that love bond, and again, all of us fail in this, but just to have that as a priority, have that as a focus. And uh, there's a quote from Tertullian in the uh, Catechism, and, he's, and he describes this as the identity of the marriage couple, you know, that this is who you are. You, you have already been joined together. Uh, you already are united in Christ. You know, just so powerful, that language of you know, we, we, when we lose our identity, when we lose who we are in God's eyes, then we lose how we're supposed to act and what life is about. So that spiritual unity is fostered by uh, praying together. And I would recommend if a couple really wants to live this out, that prayer be a daily thing. I know that you all do that, that prayer is center in worship, you know, whether it's daily worship, uh, with the sacrament, uh, you know, with communion, mass, or weekly worship, whatever that is. And statistics show that couples who pray together and worship together, not only stay together, but have a quality of marriage, because it's hard to let a lot of division come in if Jesus keeps being brought back to the center. You know, then we learn how to forgive. We learn how to uh, see each other rightly. We learn how to love each other the way that God does. So that's really the foundation of a marriage. And I think about the scripture from Jesus. It says, anybody who builds their house on a rock, on my word, builds a house on a rock, and it won't come down when the storms come. But anybody who doesn't builds it on anything else, there's going to be some storms that come that's going to knock it down, however strong it seems. So it's really on his word, on his person, that that spiritual unity is. And when that unity is there, there's enough security that a couple can be vulnerable with each other. Uh, if there's not security, if there's not a sense of I'm, I'm here with you out of the love of God for the rest of our life, then each of us begin to move into self-protection. And, and, you know, many of us bring that self-protection into relationship because of our past hurts. But when that security is there, we can begin to let down the guard and become vulnerable with each other. That is, begin to share with each other not only the things that are going well, but the, the places where we struggle, the places where we're, where we're not feeling loved or where we're not loving and we're, we're then ap apologizing to each other for the ways in which we've hurt each other. When there's that security, you can go there, you can do that. When there's a lack of that security, then what happens is emotional intimacy becomes uh, a sharing at a certain level until we're hurt. And then once we hurt each other, then we go back into our self protections. And again, this happens in every marriage. But in a marriage where there's security, we can work through that hurt. And really, the second part of uh, be devoted and unveiled, I, I really talk about how those that healing can happen, which is restoring the places where it's broken. But very simply, emotional intimacy is being able to share 
not just ideas, although that's important, but share emotions. Uh, and Thomas Aquinas talks about all the emotions are directed towards love. So that there are what we call positive emotions, which are the expression of love presence, like joy and delight and peace and comfort. Those are all expressions of the experience of love. So that's really important for a couple to be able to share emotionally. I love you. I, I just feel uh, joy when I'm with you. You know, I, you're just a delight to be with. Uh, but there's also the negative emotions, which are the reflections of the absence of love or the threat to love. And those are just as important. And how we express those is really important. So for example, what is anger? St. Thomas Aquinas says anger is the injustice of love being taken away. And what is sorrow? But it's the loss of love. I just had a grandson go off to College of the Air Force Academy and my third grandchild to leave. And there's just natural sorrow. It's honest emotion. If we don't have the freedom to share the sorrow, I know you have launched a few children yourselves. Uh, there's there's sorrow, and sometimes the sorrow is even greater. You know, a family member that dies, and and we need to have the security to be able to share those kinds of emotions too, or um, discouragement. You know, this didn't turn out the way I wanted it to turn out, and so for a couple to be able to share those feelings with each other and have that safety is really a beautiful emotional intimacy, and it builds off of spiritual unity. The third is um, daily companionship. I got them out of order before, but daily companionship is, is all the minute-to-minute -minute interactions that we have that we're not even visible. They're not even conscious to us sometimes. It's that little kiss before you go your separate ways or, or the welcome home or the sitting next to each other and folding the laundry or watching uh, a sports game on the television show or whatever it is. And I really appreciated this at a whole different level after my wife died four years ago. We would have be celebrating our 46th this year. Uh, so it was right after she died, I, I uh, just felt the absence of her presence in the home more than anything else. Just a daily, you know, here's my best friend who I see every day when I'm not out of town or she's not out of town. You know, we're, we're just with each other every day. And you take that for granted a lot of time. Uh, but just the way that you smile at each other, the way that you uh, work together side by side or uh, play together or uh, pray together, whatever that time together is. And I, I remember it most when I did two things, when I was either uh, walking by the couch where we used to sit down and watch her favorite TV show, which was HGTV, home remodeling something or other. And I wasn't interested, but I was interested in being with her. And so I got interested in the show because I was interested in being with her. And, and so it was sitting down next to each other, maybe holding hands or, or cuddling. And that kind of daily companionship is what creates that bond of unity that allows that emotional sharing to, to take place because there's that safety with each other. And then going to bed at night, you know, and for 40 some years being next to each other in the same bed, unless one of us is traveling. And to have the absence of that is like, wow, I didn't realize, you know, totally apart from the sexual intimacy of those times, but just just laying there side by side, uh, waking up in the morning and seeing that person. And, and the absence of that really allows me to see the importance of that daily com companionship. And uh, the next time that I felt is the first time I went out of town and I was actually doing a marriage conference and I cried through the whole marriage conference just as I was teaching this, just realizing at a deeper level. Um, but as soon as I got to the destination, I'd always pull out my phone. And once I got a cell phone uh, and called and let her know that I arrived. And it was just part of the ritual. And I pulled out my phone and realized there's nobody on the other end. And it was, and I put my phone down and this is the sadness, like, wow, this is, things that I never thought were important in our marriage, but they're, they're part of the daily connection uh, that just kind of glues a marriage together. Um, you know, what they say absent make a heart grow fonder, but it's presence that allows the heart to grow in love. Uh, and then the next area that kind of builds on the other three is cooperative teamwork. 
And I would say this is one of the most difficult areas in marriage. Uh, I don't know whether emotional intimacy or cooperative teamwork is more difficult, but cooperative teamwork is being able to get our egos put aside and submit our will to God's will. So most of the conflicts we have in marriage are, this is what I want. Well, this is what I want. Well, this is the way we did things in my family. Well, this is the way we did things, whether it's conscious or not, or this is how I want you to treat that child. Well, this is how I think that we should treat this child. Uh, or this is how many children I want. Well, this is how many children I want. Uh, you know, it goes on and on and on. This is how we should spend our money. This is the vacation we should go on. This is how I want the house to be clean. This is how, uh, when we should uh, do the dishes at night or, or leave them, you know, a thousand different decisions that we're making all the time. And if a couple is in communion and union in those decisions, which doesn't happen easily, then life flows pretty easily. And then that builds the emotional intimacy and the daily companionship. You like being around each other. But when there's that kind of division there, and one person or the other feels dominated or not heard or not considered, or like uh, their viewpoint is pushed down, this creates a lot of pain and separation inwardly. So we may still be functioning side by side, but inwardly we're starting to pull away. And all of a sudden you see, well, I don't want to be around you as much, or I don't want to have uh, an intimate conversation with you because I really don't trust my heart with you in this place. And so there's a couple of scriptures that, that really speak to this fourth area to me. One is um, submit yourself one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. So that implies a, a, a submission, which it goes back to the spiritual unity. It's a submission to Jesus first, that I'm not building my kingdom, I'm building your kingdom, God. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I encourage couples to pray on our conferences is they are father together, you know, as a married couple, our father, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, may your kingdom come, may your will be done in our marriage, as it is in heaven. Give us what we need today, let us forgive one another, you know, that's building that unity in marriage. Uh, and so that spiritual unity, so that mutual submission, it's really good for couples, both persons in the couple to be, be able to say, this is what I'm interested in. And I really want you to hear my interests, my desires. And I really want to hear yours. And then from there, we can say, God, what are your desires? What do you desire in these situations? And sometimes in the little things, we're not stopping to ask God those things, but we need to really hear each other. And, and so I find when couples come at come towards each other with, we will do this, or we will do this, then there's a demeaning that takes place. And there's a, there's a loss of teamwork. But when a couple says, this is what I would desire to do. And this is what I would desire to do. How can we come to a, an enthusiastic agreement? That's where the union takes place. And the fruit of that and the other four intimacies is immediately felt in the bedroom, in the sexual intimacy. Because what is that sexual intimacy? It's not just bodies coming together for sexual pleasure. That's part of it. Uh, and, you know, there are couples who, for whatever reasons, have been wounded in their own sexuality, that that becomes a difficult thing to be able to share and enjoy the pleasure of each other's bodies. But it's much more than that, because there's even a greater pleasure in the emotional and the spiritual union. And when those three things come together, when we're together, body, soul, and spirit, then there's fireworks. And then the Holy Spirit is present in that encounter, and our hearts are present. But when there's difficulties in any of those areas, when there's difficulties in spiritual unity, then our, our sexual intimacy begins to drift off into something else. Uh, because Jesus is no longer the center of our lives. When emotional intimacy isn't present, then couple, couples can participate with their bodies, but their hearts aren't connected in the intimacy. When there's not that companionship, then there's a sense of feeling awkward with each other, as opposed to when there's companionship there, you come into the bedroom, 
and there's a, a familiar closeness and it's just a natural expression of the time you've already spent together and the affection you've already had together and then when there's teamwork and you really feel respected you really feel honored and there's been this mutual submission then it's easy to submit your bodies to one another right if your hearts have already been submitted to one another if your ideas have already been submitted to one another then you naturally submit your bodies to each other and it becomes love making rather than any kind of just pleasure seeking or uh you know for my selfish purposes and so those five areas really flow together they're not five separate areas but you know i think it's helpful to emphasize each of those areas because they all build that kind of communion in marriage so i'll i'll leave it there we could talk a lot more about those and how to repair them when they're damaged but i think that's kind of fits the topic we talked about so good thank you thank you thank you can i just Absolutely. jump in with a couple of thoughts yes, real quick um may i this would be my will <laughs> this is my desire, <laughs> right? my, my desire. Um, i affirm thank you um so obviously very moved as you're sharing about you know your wife and the loss of margie and um thinking about my dad as you were sharing that uh he was widowed after 20, not even 20 years of marriage, leaving 12 children. I was five at wow. the time. Yeah. And it wasn't, and, and I, I feel like I always appreciated as much as I could the sacrifice that he made, not just daily, but mm -hmm. second by second to raise 12 children by himself and just all that his life, our lives entailed. But there was one night shortly after we were married, I want to say maybe a few months into it, where we were in bed and I just, all of a sudden, mm. it was just one of those moments where almost uncontrollable sobbing, mm. just feeling for my dad. And it wasn't, as you said, you know, the sexual thing, but just the companionship and the friendship and those ordinary things that mm. until you experience them in your own marriage, can't imagine you don't the know intense what's missing. right yeah. loss. Yeah. And so just, you know, greater appreciation, greater prayer hopefully greater empathy, you know, for others in that. Um, so just wanted to share that. And then the other thing that, I mean, all of it, everything you shared so good. And again, we can't um, encourage our listeners, viewers enough to, um, to check out your resources, these books and so many others and, and talks and such, but um, just the importance of words. And I think it kind of, that can be said for each of the five areas, you know, that you shared, but you know, the old, the old phrase, not um, what you say, but how you say it. And just the tweak of one word, right? Like I want versus I desire or declaring versus presenting. Um, and then thinking in that realm, uh, a dear friend of ours who was present at our daughter's wedding um, last May, a year ago, May, um, a, a priest, he pointed out that it was the first time that he had uh, noticed the change with the liturgy, um, with the exchange of the rings, it used yeah. to be take this ring, and yeah. then it was switched to the more or the closer translation of receive. Mm -hmm. oh, so wow. even that wow. that yeah. that That's, difference of take yeah. versus yeah. receive, and yeah. so just that was resonating uh, in my mind as you were sharing, and just the importance of of those. Uh, the meanings and of word choices and such. Yeah. Go ahead. Wow. Mindful that our time is at an end and the desire for more of this, any of you who are watching this right now should impel you to go to JPII, jp2healingcenter.org mm -hmm. and check out some of the events and books that really do um, speak to hearts and minds, particularly in relationship of husband and wife. Um, Bob, if you could land us in this particular way, Many who may be seeing this in particular ways feel locked in to patterns, perhaps their own sin, perhaps their spouse's sin, and they perhaps are making declarations, he will never change, she will never change. You're in this work in ministry because you have seen the transforming power of Jesus Christ. You give testimony to that in your own marriage, and everywhere you go, you see couples bringing that same baggage struggle, I give up, this is, he's not going to change, etc. So just if you could simply give us a strong declaration testimonial about the fact that God still is a God of change and transformation. And then if you could close us in prayer. I will. Yeah. I'm glad you bring that up because we do get stuck 
in patterns, all of us. Uh, and it can become hopeless when those patterns mm -hmm. keep persisting and we don't have the things that we desire in our relationship. And, you know, in my own experience of that, there were certain areas that were good in our marriage and there are certain areas that were lacking. And I can say that's where prayer is so important. You know, I think of St. Monica with her husband and her son and the persistence of that prayer. Mm -hmm. And even if the other won't pray together with you, that you can be praying and just praying for your heart, your own heart to change because that's where the change needs to take place. And in a certain sense, people can resist love for a time, but it's hard to resist love for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, what they can easily resist is criticism and anger and judgment. And, you know, that just continues to build the walls. But when we love in the way that Christ loves in response to things that aren't going our way, which is very difficult, uh, you know, it takes a lot of growth inside of us. Then, then we begin to see things change. And so prayer and love really are the key to that. I would say mm -hmm. uh, at the back of Be Devoted, there's a whole section in there on how do you bring healing in those different areas. So I think there's a lot of practical things that can be put into place uh, and things to be addressed that, that help facilitate that. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. If you could lead us in prayer. Yeah, I will. Thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for every person who's listening. Uh, those who are listening as married couples, those who are listening as individuals who are married, those who are maybe gone through a divorce or a uh, death of a spouse, those who are planning and desiring marriage, those who are in uh, other vocations, uh, priesthood or religious life, or they're single right now. Just pray for every person that there would be ways in which you, Holy Spirit, will speak individually to each one's heart mm -hmm. in areas of growth, areas of realization, areas of transformation. And I pray particularly where there's areas of disappointment or discouragement or even despair uh, for the things that we desire. I just pray for you to bring new hope, new vision, and new determination. And I ask all this uh, in Jesus with the intercession of Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, and that the love that they shared would be multiplied into our lives. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Folks, Amen. thank you so much for being with us on this journey of ever deepening encounter of who we are, whose we are in the Holy Trinity and the gift of the church that guides us in living that more deeply as our most defining quality, as Dr. Bob mentioned that Matthew 7, 21, building on solid rock. The constant is there's going to be storms and they're going to shake and they're going to move. But uh, the variable is whether or not we choose to be built on solid rock or shifting sand. And we are so blessed to be with you on that journey. Check out this entire movement at ilovemyfamily.us. And again, I do direct you to our uh, brother Bob's amazing work, talks, mm -hmm. Um, conferences, so many good things. I'd say even particularly newer outreaches to priests, probably not newer anymore, but that are very powerful for priests and taking place throughout the country. JPII, jp2healingcenter.org. Until next time, God bless God you bless all. You. Thanks so much, Bob. Take care.